class concern. Hello, Valerie. During our online lecture on Zoom today, I had noticed that you were drinking a Bud Light. I myself love Bud Light also. I do not mind that you were having a drink. I am just concerned for the fact that it was 8 a.m. on a Monday night. <laughs> <laughs> just want to make sure everything is okay. Feel free to message me if anything is concerning you, as I am always here for my students. Dr. Boo! Yeah, the problem is you're drinking a Bud Light. <laughs> Gross. Gross. Look, you seem to be at an all-time low. Uh, second only to Zima. Um, <laughs> Zima. What the hell is Zima? That one I've went over never my head had too. Zima. Zima is that thing that was mentioned on the Red Letter oh, Media. Yeah, the one Zima, it's like, the clear Zima? liquor with like the, the blue and silver label. It's like 1% alcohol. That sucks. It's, yeah. it's like worse than a non-alcoholic drink. Because the non-alcoholic's at least saying... You're getting nothing. One percent's the promise of it's the it's the tickling I, of. I why would you drink that unless you like liked the taste of hops? Ugh. I don't even know if it tastes. No one likes like the beer. taste of hops. Anyway. And welcome to Two Roommates <laughs> with a Podcast. My name is Brent. My pronouns are he and him. Hi, my name is Kirk. My pronouns are any and all, but they and them is preferred. And our first guest. Can you believe it? We made it far enough to have a guest. I'm so honored. Uh, my name is Aaron. Um, I was formerly these two idiots' roommate. Uh, that's and uh, my pronouns are he him. That's true. It, Aaron is definitely an honorary roommate, considering we've been roommates. Already. I'll tell you but, what. Yeah. Visiting you guys, it's like your your lifestyle has literally not even changed <laughs> a little bit hey, since college. Humidifiers now. That's true. Dude, okay, that, that is a, that is a change. Dude, is a personal change. growth is stupid. <laughs> I never heard of her. Yeah, you know, there's only one kind of personal growth I'm doing, and it's at the waist. Hey! <laughs> Post college life is going oh downhill. God. We're all they don't. They tell you about the freshman fifteen. They don't tell you about the COVID fifteen. <laughs> yeah, we're all shells of our. Anyway, this existence. week on Boomer Facebook memes. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, shit. So we had you on uh, not because you're our friend or we care about your life or anything, uh-huh. but you researched something. Uh huh. Oh, yeah. You um, did you, what the rest of us can only dream of accomplishing. Going to go, grad school? I certainly going, hope your aspirations are higher than go, that. Going to the neoliberal hell. Neoliberal hell. The Chicago. neoliberal hell known as the University of Chicago. Yes. Uh, what? You, you wrote you? a paper. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, just this little thing called, and how's this for, how's this for a title? Uh, is that doxing myself if I read my paper title? Yes, it is. Anyway, <laughs> it's about the... It's about the <laughs> the Robert Taylor Homes, a public housing project in the city of Chicago, uh, which was built in the 60s and demolished between 98 and 2008. Um, and tens of thousands of Chicagoans used to live there, and now it's mostly empty fields. And So they used to live there. Uh, uh, what happened? Uh, Why don't they live there anymore? Well, uh, what had happened was uh, the city of Chicago was mandated by the federal government to knock down all of its substandard public housing. Um, and they, it was really substandard. The Robert Taylor home, in terms of its <laughs> conditions, had been disinvested in for a very long time. What are you talking about? The city of Chicago didn't invest in black communities? Is this I, a breaking report on I, two roommates with a report. podcast? Yeah, so... Um, what to do? So, yeah, no. Kurt, uh, you have to get this out to NBC. Chicago to doesn't care about black people. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> they never saw this coming. So, yeah. Um, uh, and I wanted to share from my, from my research, which is all about how basically... Uh, the city really fucked over these people uh, that live in this community, all like they're who are like you know ninety nine point whatever percent black, a hundred percent very low income. Fucked over these people's lives by destroying their homes and kicking them out of their neighborhood, mm-hmm. kicking the poor's out. It's a time honored tradition of the city of Chicago um, and all cities everywhere. But I wanted to share an anecdote from the research that is relevant Hey-o. to what was in the news this week. So. Hey, you're already doing more than us. <laughs> you're covering. Uh, there you go. There you go. Uh, so I don't know if you've seen uh, the image from Texas where there is there are icicles hanging oh, yeah. from a goddamn ceiling fan, mm-hmm. uh, and 
it, it was on Twitter, I saw it, and the person captions it with like, I don't care if Northerners make fun of me, I'm not built for this. And all the Northerners in the comments going, no, that's that's that doesn't happen. <laughs> Icicles do not grow from the ceiling fans. Um, you probably have a burst pipe. In fact, no, you definitely have a burst, burst pipe. <laughs> the ceiling is going to come down very shortly, and you should get your valuables out, and preferably your family, if you can. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, pipes bursting in cold weather. They could go to Cancun. If they could afford They could go to Cancun. Cancun. Um, yeah. Or, as I've been informed, Ted Cruz's house is vacant. Is it true? <laughs> it is open to occupy. Back. I thought he came back. So, and besides, there was always the dog. The well, dog was holding down the fort. So, yeah. So, first of all, um, I don't recognize Ted Cruz's uh, claim over that <laughs> building. I don't um, recognize his claim on humanity. I, That's I, in dispute heavily. Heavily in dispute. Ted Cruz ain't my son. You heard it here first. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, this anecdote. Uh, there's a really bad blizzard on January 2nd, 1999. Hmm. Uh, and it buries the city of Chicago under two feet of snowfall, which is up there. Uh, it is the second worst blizzard of the 20th century. Um, and followed immediately after that by a week of temperatures in the single digits and really bad wind chills. Um, and a bunch of pipes froze and burst in heating systems across um, the Chicago Housing Authority's public housing, one of which was in the Taylor Homes. The Robert Taylor Homes buildings were 16 stories tall. Mm-hmm. Uh, and on the 16th story, um, a standpipe burst. Uh, and water cascaded down the entirety of the staircase. Jesus. Um, and because the Robert Taylor homes are built the way a motel is built, which is to say there are door, there's an exterior causeway uh-huh. and exterior staircases, which are partially enclosed at points, but they're exterior. Oh, really? And then rooms on that causeway, just like, just like a motel, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but except for it's a high rise building. Right. Yeah, so on the top story It doesn't this, seem like it should have... <laughs> uh, it has a lot to do with uh, uh, Le Corbusier-inspired architecture. Uh-huh. The idea was there would be these uh, sidewalks, streets in the sky, and it would function as a center of community life for the, for, the, for the housing project. And because of that idea, which was a mid-20th century idea, and when the Robert Taylor's homes were built, they look like that. So there, it's 16 stories of motel rooms basically um in terms of how you like if you haven't seen one of these gallery style buildings that's what it looks like um except for people kept throwing bricks off the top of it and like kids kept falling off of it (laughs) so so they put a chain link fence on the causeway so so now the whole entire facade of the building is covered in a chain link fence now it looks like an indoor prison that's nice it it there is certainly uh some some very uh depressing imagery associated uh (laughs) Look, with the buildings. throwing bricks off the building is cool. Throwing kids off the building is not so cool. I don't know if they threw kids off the building. I think the problem was like well, kids I mean, if were falling off I the got building. Like 10 bucks or something. Imagine there's Oh, yeah, off the 16th pool. floor? Yeah, yeah, yeah. you <laughs> survive that. You get, yeah. that, you get that week's Deadpool. Yeah. <laughs> what, what, uh, what floor can you fall off? We'll pay you more. <laughs> For every floor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You get like, you know, 20 bucks off the fifth one, 60 it's a, bucks off it's the fifth. It's a good month. way for, for the local kids to just have a good time in a very safe environment constructed for them by the city of Chicago. <clears throat> yeah. Anyway, so because the staircases are enclosed mm-hmm. and water is cascading down them, they're enclosed, but they're not inside. All the water freezes on the staircases. So there's just water down this 16-floor concrete staircase. So lots of ice. Lots of ice. Um, and then it's so it's it's zero degrees. And also the elevators in these buildings were notorious for never working. Shocker. <laughs> so the elevators are broken, and the only way up and down up and down is a staircase completely coated in ice. Um, so anyway, at this point, um, oh yeah, and also heating goes out because the heating, the water is, uh, uh, the source of the heating in the building because it's water pressure, radiator heat. Yeah. Um, so the building loses water and heat. Um, five families are immediately evacuated from that building. 
um, because they were using their ovens to heat their homes. Mm. And the ovens are also substandard, so they're leaking carbon monoxide. God damn it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> now, this is just one building um, where, you know, the, the one in which the water burst, cascaded down 16 flights of stairs, froze it, and, you know, turned it into an icy death trap. Um, but power and heat, or not power, heat and water were lost at multiple buildings, um, at least five within the Taylor homes and two buildings, at least, well, actually one building at the Horner homes, which is on the west side. So they have to evacuate all of these people. And they end up having, they distribute like 300 space heaters and then like in, while they're trying to find hotel rooms for these people, and then they move 700 residents into hotel rooms on its own dime while they try to like refurbish some abandoned apartments and other buildings to like place them there. So uh, the next winter, uh, they go, well, what if that happens again? So they take the buildings that they have determined are going to be substandard and aren't going to survive another winter like that. And they start moving people out of them. Mm -hmm. uh, and this makes it easier to tear all the buildings down which where they were in the process of doing Anyway, because they want to sell it off to private developers and maybe redevelop it so some nice middle in middle income folks can come in because they got to kick the pores out. So yeah, and that's relevant because uh, some folks in uh, some part of the country I hear also lost water and had pipes burst and heat mm -hmm. go out and because of a storm. And the state was also inadequate in its response. And, and this leads me to my big theme. All crises further accumulation. Well, yeah. Every kidding? time there's a crisis, oh, yeah. it can be used to concentrate wealth in the hands of the elite. That's the entire thesis of uh, disaster capitalism by no Naomi Klein. Like, in every... Uh, she was mainly talking about, like, uh, third world countries. Like, you construct disasters. Like, in Chile, you know, once you kick Allende out... And then you try to introduce shock therapy and things just keep getting worse and worse. But then it becomes more of an excuse to be like, well, you, you, re you really haven't tried free market economics yet. Have you really 100%? And I have there's a, a safety net. You got to strip those away. I have a theory. I have in, uh, introducing a theory into the uh, fascist conspiracy. Uh, we love those here. Yeah, yeah, the fascist conspiracy. I don't Kirk's been talking about eugenics for two weeks. eugenicist conspiracy. <laughs> now... I have a theory about this, and the theory is not that there is a fascist conspiracy uh, to do eugenics, although obviously they want to do eugenics. Mm -hmm. there, That's the end. My theory about the fascist conspiracy is neoliberalism is a massive fascist op. Ah, oh, yeah. Which is designed to destroy the functioning of government and to make it so shitty uh, that they will replace it with... No market regulation. Mm. No market regulation and regressive social policies, all the makings of fascism. That makes sense because neoliberalism is you point at the market regulation and you say this isn't working, we need less. And then and you keep cutting it down to nothing. And uh, until, your ceiling, until your ceiling fan looks like an icicle and you go, yes. I don't understand how this happened. Uh, officer, we've had a doozy. Today. And also, it, my my electricity bill this month is seventeen hundred dollars. Boy, Which, that's weird. Anyway, it so sounds like there's too much government regulation. This is a fun one because, uh, and this is why my fa my conspiracy about the fascists doing neoliberalism as an op to make government regulation bad so they can do uh, cronyism and then regressive social policies, just like the Nazis. The goddamn Texas thing. Oh, Earp got the goddamn Texas thing. So we've all heard about the ridiculous, uh, like people being out of power because Texas electric grid is dumb. But what's fun is uh, the deregulation, um, and actually, not so much deregulation, but like really shitty regulation because so. The power grid is run by a private group, but it's overseen by um, the Texas um, like utility board, right? Which is appointed. Uh, it is called the the Electric Reliability Council of Texas. That's the private entity, and the public entity is called the Public Utility Commission of Texas. So you got the PUC. <laughs> And the Pucat, the 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 and the Ercot. the Pucat and the <laughs> Ercot. Uh, not to be confused with Epcot, um, Walt Disney's burial site. That's yes. 
So the PUCOT is the government entity that is regulating the utilities. And regulating in scare quotes. Regulating right. in scare quotes. And the ERCOT is the quasi-private group heavily regulated by the PUCOT, which <laughs> sets the price of electricity That's in pretty- Texas, as, as well as many other things in terms of utilities. So uh, at some point, the PUCOT told uh, the Reliability Council that the price of electricity was too low last week. Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. They said the price of utility... Mm-hmm. So, so basically, the Public Utility Commission goes... Uh, the price of electricity does not reflect the president's the present scarcity. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you have to up it to the cap, which is legally set at nine thousand dollars per megawatt hour. Jesus Christ! Which is how you get the ridiculous prices. Now that wouldn't be a problem because most people have like fixed contracts for their electricity, where they're paying a fixed rate, and it's not. That's just the wholesale price of electricity. The problem is uh, because of deregulation. There's companies like Gritty. Like as in grid mm. E. It sounds like a Silicon not Valley the, not the oh, tech company. It's the Wally ripoff or predecessor. So it sounds like a Silicon Valley tech company because it is because it's an app that allows you to like gamify your power. Jesus. Because Christ. you are instead of having a fixed deal, what Gritty does, which provides uh, power to twenty nine thousand households in Texas, um, and this is where most of the insane prices are coming from, is this company. It's um, just like Uber, you know, you need to get you. They, they, yeah. So what you do is you, instead of having a fixed agreement, you, you always buy, uh, the, at the wholesale price of electricity. Sometimes that saves you money. Sometimes it, uh, costs you money, but on the long run, I can think it probably costs you money because otherwise it would not be a good business model if it wasn't charging people more for electricity. Right. So, or in the incident of, uh, you know, a, a once in a decade event could possibly put you out of house and home, but that would never happen. That would never happen. Go Texas, so need to secede. The Public Utility Commission tells the uh, Electric Reliability Council to crank the dial up as high as it'll go on the uh, wholesale price of electricity. And if you have a, uh, if you are a gritty member where you use a little app to regulate your your <laughs> electricity usage and stuff like that, and you're always buying electricity at the wholesale price, you will get, you know, $16,000 electricity bills, and that's how that happens. Jesus because Christ. we turned uh, a public utility into a Silicon Valley app. So That's why this apartment is sponsored by ComEd. ComEd, buying all your electricity uh, needs at a... At a state monopoly price. At a state monopoly <laughs> price. Uh, that is right. I get I get my my state monopoly, my state mandated uh, electricity. The same way I get my state mandated weed. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Michael Madigan. Uh, well, rip rest, to the king. Rest in, Michael Madigan. Rest in peace, Mikey. We'll have to do an episode on him at some oh, point. Oh. Rest in peace, buddy. You were the most powerful man in the Midwest. Go fuck yourself. <laughs> Marry and piss. Oh, rest in piss. I remember when I combed through the Wikipedia page. <laughs> Michael <laughs> Madigan. <laughs> <They> looked, <laughs> I, I combed Kirk. through the Wikipedia page and I'm like, Brent, did you know that Michael J. Madigan did this thing? Did you know Michael J. Madigan was <laughs> once quoted said... as being anti racist? And Brent was like, go fuck yourself. I said you cut. I thought you said you cummed through the Wikipedia page. <laughs> oh God! And I was very confused. No, Kirk looking through Michael Mad because Kirk, as we said, uh, as we said, uh, they're an Iowa native. Uh, going through the list of Michael Madigan's just Tra- travails. Yeah, uh, his expeditions his, in his, politics. His, his fun times, the ups, the downs. Getting to look at that. The thrill of victory, the agony of defeat. <laughs> <laughs> what defeat? It's well, never been well, defeated. Well, He's fucking lifetime. Now, now. That guy's huh? Tyson. He bit off he bit off Pritzker's ear, but apparently <laughs> he got <laughs> he got benched. Uh, so, yeah, so this gritty thing, which is allowed to exist because of deregulation, combined with the fact that a government agency went and told, went and done told the power company that the electricity was too cheap and it wasn't reflecting scarcity. Just awesome. That's what you want. Out of your that's television. what you want out of. But that's what you, when you move to Texas, you know, you no income tax. The government tells private corporations you need to pay more. So this is the insane thing, right? Is why would a why would a public company go, hey, um, you need to charge people more for electricity? Well, it's because they're insane, and they're insane in the way that uh, all neoliberals are insane, which is that they think that uh, price gouging is good because it prevents like 
mm-hmm. a run on the scarce resource. Yeah. When when you charge uh, $15 for a gallon of drinking water because you don't have as much drinking water because everyone's buying it during a crisis, it will keep people from buying that $15 a gallon drinking water instead of racking up a large amount of debt because... Water is a human need. Now, now we there's a slight externality with all of these things. Poor people die, but that's an externality. externality the market externality, is externality, willing the to market absorb. Is the market is working, except for the externalities. Well, no, no, it is. It is working, including the externalities. That's that little plus. The externalities are in built lot, in, and a lot of staff love of, them, but they're external. How could they them. be built in? <laughs> and a lot, in, no, no, no. In a lot of that sti- would make them internal. No, in a lot of statistic equations, there's a little plus, and it's a little plus randomness and that randomness in this case is, is the, the is, is the mass grave of poor people in yeah, texas yeah. but so, that i'm sorry i'm sorry you cuck communists but that's called market efficiency so here's the thing i don't understand about this is even if you apply this logic uh which is to say even if you apply the idea that jacking up the prices when there's scarcity in a crisis because it will prevent people from you know stockpiling the resource and make it generally more readily available although expensive like only makes sense if you think people are going to stockpile the resource so in the case of drinking water it's to ensure that all the drinking water in the walmart isn't taken away and there's at least some for somebody to go buy you could just put a limit on how many but here's the thing what are people gonna how is that applied to power outages the idea is there isn't enough electricity for everybody so we're going to do scarcity like, what are people going to do? Stockpile electricity by turning all the lights on in all in their house? <laughs> yeah. like they're going to they're going to they're going to they're going to they're gonna like, oh, you know, we got to we got to prepare for a disaster. Let me like flip the light switch back and on, off off. <laughs> Off and on really no, they fast. actually have a, they have a thousand rechargeable car batteries <laughs> in the closet, and they're hooking it up to the outlet. I mean, <laughs> just to and, and and I guess you know what you could say is well, what it's supposed to do is encourage people via you know the incentive of, of the market to in like price signals uh to use less electricity which would then mean there's more in the grid which would then mean they would maybe need to do less rolling blackouts but that is just like telling people oh well the solution here is turn the power off in your house the- and it's negative degrees outside so you it's your fault it's happening and you need to be in the cold <clears throat> so Yes. That way it can... So, that, and that's the only solution. That's the only and, thing that could have and, happened. And and there isn't really a solution in the moment to this. Like The, the solution the, was 10 years ago, come up with a better regulatory was, agency. The, the solution, yeah, the solution <laughs> is... Like, there's no way, once you're in it, to make it so that there's more power. Like, there's more electricity. You can't just, like, poof, magic some electricity overnight. You can't, like, just do that. So there's no way to solve it in the moment. It's just, like... Yeah, no, the only way out of here is uh, you you need to freeze. Um, um, another thing, too, is to make it so that, like, the individual uh, power companies that are generating the power uh, can't shut themselves down prior to the storm. Because if they were to continue operating throughout the storm, the cost of their fuel would go up, and then they wouldn't be running at a profit. So they shut down, lessened the amount of power that was available in the in, in the grid in general, and uh, now it's trying to get those back up and running. But you know, you you're already costing because because you shut down. It would have behooved them to just stay up. Yeah. So the the two themes are um, neoliberalism <laughs> is a fascist op to make government regulation of the market seem bad so that we need something to replace it. And to replace it, we're going to do fascism. Uh, and two, all crises further accumulation because uh, via the stupid electricity app, uh, we're going to burn people's lives savings by by jacking up the price of electricity and taking all their money. Uh, to transition back to the Robert Taylor Holmes, considering we're not experts on Texas public utility. I became one about oh, yeah. an hour ago. <laughs> I became one about an hour ago. What are you talking about? No, I remember a part in your paper when you said the Chicago Housing Authority, which is the institution that originally made the Robert Taylor Homes. Yes. They, instead of becoming a provider of public housing, mm-hmm. they became a broker of public housing, yes. which is that nice little, yes. nice little we're, twist. We're, we're not in the business of providing public housing. We're just here to make sure 
uh, that the the market is functioning. Uh, it's the same shit we're doing in healthcare. The government's not supposed to provide healthcare to you via a public option. No, we have healthcare marketplaces. Or to subsidize the building of high income high mm-hmm. <laughs> high income or, apartments. Or we have uh, the the Public Utilities Commission of Texas, which their role is not to provide electricity to people at an affordable rate. It's to ensure that market competition does its thing to provide electricity to people so it's it's just this this thing that doesn't work called um uh the there's a name for it it's an appendage on your body um you, you can't see it you can't see it it's um uh, your nose the, yeah, the ghostly the ghostly uh um digits there is a the, the invisible limb. hand no, that's not. That's not. <laughs> there's phantom limb, and then there's the uh, the sense where you like can tell where the various parts on your body are, so you can like close your nose, close your eyes, and close touch your, your nose. nose. Um, uh, I don't remember the name of that. Is it like that? Yes, it's exactly like that. Okay, uh, so that it's like capitalism meadow... is when you capitalism is when you capitalism is when you cut your hand off, um, but you can still sort of feel it. Oh, Phantom. Yeah, that, yeah, I thought you were doing a bit. I didn't realize you actually yeah. lost the name of the yeah, Phantom Limb. It's like a Phantom Limb or a Phantom. Pain. No, I was doing a bit. What? Oh. It was a bit. Oh. Apparently it wasn't a very good one. <laughs> uh, so yeah, no, that's um it's all just government abdicating its responsibility to provide the basic needs of people to the bare minimum extent that it kind of did in the twentieth century, and now it's just oh, we're just facilitating market opportunities. Which are three words Facilitating in that order. Market opportunity. I hate so much. So yeah, I think that's the. It's anyway, yeah, that's that's what I got. Uh, what do you think your favorite part of was your research? What was the favorite thing you learned while researching? My favorite thing I learned while researching. Um, my favorite thing about history, period, is the stories you learn. Like this story about how uh, power going out during a winter storm made it easier for the Chicago Housing Authority to, uh, you know, kick people out of their homes. But also, you know, there's this other story of people in the Robert Taylor homes um, creating a program, an educational program, where they, like, grew worms, which is a real thing I didn't know. Like, think about it like commercial usage of like worms or even like usage as a consumer good for like fishing those have to come from somewhere so they grew worms which are relatively easy to like Mm -hmm. do animal agriculture for um in like beds and they were also raising fish in tanks in like makeshift space in an in a disused apartment in one of the buildings and this was an education program that went on for years um and in addition to this, they also operated a food bank um, in partnership with various local businesses and churches uh, out of makeshift space uh, in you know, converted residential space in the Taylor homes. And I like these little stories of people who, given a really shitty deal, managed to make something out of it. Now, the... You're not going to guess. You're, you're never going to believe what happened to the fish. Uh, the power got shut off and they all died. <laughs> <laughs> they all froze to death. Serves Jeez. those fuckers right. Uh, the, worms, <laughs> the worms, a little bit more resilient, but same thing. Uh, and they froze in the winter. Uh, now, it, it, so there's, there's like a hopelessness and a, and a futility to that kind of human struggle. But that level of human drama... Um, and acted on that very small scale is was my favorite thing about studying the, the Taylor homes. So when you said that they were raising the worms in beds, I know you mean soil beds. I know you know I mean soil beds. I, you're I, I know you in did. my head I, I was picturing you, a feather I need mattress. You to specify it was not in a mattress. I want to be able to sleep tonight. Oh, that's right. You're scared of worms. Yes. So how's this for an image? The worm was actually the size of a person, and its name was Gregor Samsa. <laughs> what the fuck? Uh, and the worm woke up in the bed one morning, discovering it had turned into a worm. As oh. Gregor Samsa eines Morgens hat aufgewachen. Oh, Jesus. See, Christ. we all have the one thing we know how to quote in German. Mine is, um, um, <laughs> Wer heitet zu spät, wer heitet zu spät durch Nacht und Wind? Es ist ein Vater mit seinem Kind. Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah. Hey Brent, what's the one, what's the thing in German the you know how to quote? What's German quote that pops into mind? Uh, uh, Liebensraum. Uh, mm-hmm. 
I took uh, three different t- strokes. I, as we talked, <laughs> I took three terms of German. None of it stuck. Lehman's round that stuck. That's well. That yeah. That. Like, well, fortunately, it didn't for very long. Well, that's true. It did, and then it didn't. And then, and then, and then, Soviet T thirty fours rolled into Eastern Europe and very quickly put a stop stop to that. Right. Uh, thank you, Stalin. This is a tanky so, podcast. How, how would you? No, it's not. No, it's no, not. No, it's not. I would like to be clear. It is not. Uh, <laughs> we we have some distant rose but rose glass memories of the Soviet Union, but we have. Yeah, we. I I I, I choose to look at. Uh, the Red Army of the 1940s through Rook's Conclusions. <laughs> I am sure they did war crimes. Well, so and a lot of wow. Union did a lot of bad things. Oh, Berlin. Yeah, forgot about but Berlin. There yes, is they definitely a, did war <laughs> but there is a reason why when I added the flag of the uh, the German Democratic Republic in our Discord server, yeah, so I called it Good Germany. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the, the the East German Communist Party famed uh, <laughs> fighters for liberty. Yeah, the Stasi, uh, famous. The, the Stasi, the Stasi are like if if the CIA was good. So so presumably in the... <laughs> that's a, that's not true. I'm sorry, I have to clarify. The Stasi are not good. good Lord. So presumably in the Taylor homes, it started like. I, I imagine it had better intentions than it ended. Like, it had a higher ideal so, when it was built. I want to read you... So, so my question yeah, was, like, how did it fall the way it did? Or how did it decline? Or like, like, I, I think, and, yeah, the beyond, architect had a vision. And it was like the original you were saying, right. of, like, like sidewalks in the sky and, like, a, a community in, in this 16-story uh, complex... How did the, you know, that, that architect's philosophy become the end product? Beyond so just Chicago doesn't care about that. I think people. far more, far more, and um, the best book on this specific topic is um, a book called Blueprint for Disaster. Um, and it is all about the rise and fall of the Chicago Housing Authority. Um, and it has lots of takeaways on this one. And I could get into, like the specifics but i think the way i want to answer that question is uh with a quote and this was written um long before the taylor homes were built long before the 1937 uh you know housing act created modern public housing as a means of social uplift for mostly black mostly low-income populations in cities uh this comes to us from wb du bois uh noted uh, founder of the or co-founder of the double uh, the NAACP uh, and uh, later uh, convert to uh, the science of uh, Marxism, uh, the immortal <laughs> science of Marxism, uh, and we all got degrees in that baby. <laughs> and I think it uh, is emblematic of the perpetual generational struggle and striving for better life, particularly for Black Americans, but for all proletarians in general. And he reads, or he writes, So dawned the time of storm and drong, storm and stress. Today rocks our little boat on the mad waters of the world sea. There is within and without the sound of conflict, the burning of body and rending of soul. Inspiration strives with vain doubt, with doubt and faith with vain questioning. The bright ideals of the past, physical freedom, political power, the training of brains and the training of hands, All these in turn have waxed and waned until even the last grows dim and overcast. Are they all wrong? All false? No, not that. But each alone was oversimple, incomplete. The dreams of a credulous race childhood or the fond imaginings of the other world, which does not know and does not want to know our power. And uh, W.D. Boyce, The Souls of Black Folk, 1903. So there's a lot in there, and I think the thing I would pull out is that the 1937 Housing Act, the building of the Taylor Homes, which is, you know, there's a, there's a through line from the creation of the Public Housing Administration of the United States in 37 to the building of the Taylor Homes in 62, and that represents sort of one policy paradigm in how we're going to provide housing to people. How are we going to solve the problem of people need a decent place to live? Um and particularly, how are we going to solve that problem under capitalism, <laughs> being a New Deal program? Mm-hmm. So uh, the the Public Housing Administration. So uh, 
was it all wrong? Was every are there no positive things about the about public housing? Uh, no, there's lots of really really good uh, lessons, positive lessons to be learned about about providing people with safe uh, and affordable housing. Um, and the public, the National Public Housing Museum, yes, National Public Housing Museum, which is a museum based in Chicago, is is, is currently doing a lot of work of categorizing this category. Cate- Cate- Categorizing. No, cataloging. Catalog. Cataloging. The National Public Housing Museum is currently doing a lot of good work around cataloging those stories um, and placing them within proper historical context. They have a trained uh, oral history core, and they collect the stories of public housing, former public housing residents in Chicago, former and current, I should say. And so there are positive lessons to be learned from this 20th century experiment in public housing. Um, but each of these attempts to, to, you know, uplift, um, a people in, in this case, in the case that W.E.B. W. Du Bois is talking about, uplift, um, the social and economic conditions of black Americans is incomplete. And it is incomplete, um, because we, 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 we just aren't there yet. There are things we haven't taken into consideration. The dreams of a credulous race childhood or the fond imaginings of the other world which does not know and does not want to know our power. Um, and uh, that's the note I would put on that. Do you have any uh, no, thoughts good. of your own on this matter? Uh, uh, on, on the plight of black people in America? Uh, yeah, no, I don't. Uh, no, uh, no. Uh, no. It, was, it was a reference to uh, uh, Good Will Hunting. Oh, okay. Did you have any thoughts of your own on this matter? You're going to realize two things. One, don't do that. Two... You spent it forty thousand dollars a year on an education. You only got forty thousand. Yeah, now only that, 40, now that education. Probably, like, now my tip like sixty. Uh, what did I get? I, in debt? I got. I was sixteen thousand dollars in debt for my undergrad. Uh, praise lucky, be. To, lucky you. <laughs> yeah, praise be to uh, Tom and his teacher pension, uh, and thirty for my one year in masters in my master's program. Yeah, yeah, sweet paper out of it. Oh, so a, if you so imagine it's Aaron, bright eyed, bushy tailed, still has a speck of hope in life. When was this? I'm just <laughs> no, I'm saying imagine this oh, okay. if you can. So you're it's like uh, it's in the mid seventies. You're the leader of the Chicago Housing Authority. What would you have done different? What things could a person in that position done different? So. Uh, thing Solve number one. The problems. No, Solve I'm saying go the back problems. In time. Stop no, saying having them be problems. Right. right. If you were the head of the Chicago Housing Authority, what could you have realistically done to make this better? Well, I mean, first of all, post nineteen fifty something, the Chicago Housing Authority is entirely suborned to the Daily Machine. Uh, it had an independent streak for a while. It was headed by a name, headed by a, a new dealer called Elizabeth Wood, who was genuinely a true believer in the mission of public housing. Um, and she did a lot of great things over a very long period of time, um, but was ultimately unsuccessful in turning the Chicago Public Housing Authority into what perhaps she thought it could have been. She quit, resigned, was fired, <laughs> and now Daly, after that point, in about the 50s, Daly is now fully in charge of the Chicago Housing Authority, which is to say, you know, its board is, appoint- is, a- is appointed by the mayor and all that stuff. Um Obviously, you know, this is like the question that every historian hates. But, um, I mean, tenant, tenant say in property management sooner. That's a thing that was experimented with in the 80s and 90s and even today. Uh, tenant involvement in the management process of properties, I think, is, is one thing that anyone who is seriously committed to the idea of public housing move forward needs to, needs to mm-hmm. understand. The state is not going to be able to simply tell, you know, poor black people you know, this is how you shall live. Mm-hmm. And that's that's not a desirable outcome. Learn from the experiences of that one New Deal city made in like the 1930s where you put people in a town. They oh, had yeah. everything. Uh, Greenfield, they, Maryland. Yes, they yeah. had control <laughs> the of fuck? everything. Learn or from Greenbelt, the experiences. Maryland. Greenbelt, Maryland. Uh, we, we both watched Do Not Eat and we both watched Do Not Eat extensively. Okay. So... 
Yes. My goddamn fucking history nerds. Also, I st- I went to I holds up fifty page thesis. I did go to graduate <laughs> school and studied public health and public <laughs> history. So yeah. um, that's why we brought you on, and the only reason why we brought you yes, on, Aaron. Yes. Yes. Uh, I I will be driving after, after this. Uh, You're kicking me out, and I'm driving home. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I know. I know. Uh, <laughs> and then the other thing would be uh, that. There is no way to ensure housing to people in a... Oh, great. This is where this is going. Uh, you need, We need to overthrow and decommodify <laughs> housing as a concept. Well, that's ideal, yes. <laughs> yes. Um, trying to provide even public housing in a market is, well, yeah, is be- problematic. The other thing I would say Because saying is, the word affordable housing already sets it down a slope of, yep. well, now what's affordable? Affordable housing is already a compromise. Let's means test it. Uh, right. And then means it's a, test that would be the other thing I would say. It's affordable is, if you have a median income household income of one hundred thirty thousand dollars. The other thing I would say is um, D. Bradford Hunt. I couldn't remember his name. D. Bradford. D. Initial D. Bradford Hunt. He was the author of the book um, Blueprint for Disaster on the history of the Chicago Housing Authority. The other point he makes is that means testing fucks up the thing you're trying to the the service you're trying to provide because once it's only for poor people. No one else has an interest in maintaining it. So if 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 in a dream universe, uh, like public housing was coming back in a very big way, and there was a lot of federal dollars input to make it happen, and there was the political willpower and political capital to do so, um, or if indeed a random uh, historian was put back in charge of the Chicago Housing Authority in the 1970s, <laughs> uh, a, a, a thing which should be understood is that it should be a provision for all regardless of income means testing it by saying well you have to have a certain income threshold to be in public housing makes the whole thing way shittier you're you're concentrating uh poverty in a few communities and because of that like those communities are under-resourced like in in all ways and then those communities become what you know sensationalist journalists journalists in the 80s deemed like these 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 high-rise ghettos of public housing social commentators in the 80s had their own explanations for why uh public housing failed and produced these very ghettoized uh slums with you know high crime rates and, and everything else uh a lot of those reasons are you know if not misguided if not blatantly racist uh but that's the thing is when you when you put all the poor people in a big tall building and you completely disinvest from their community you end up with things like the the Taylor homes and I don't want to reinforce the notion that the Taylor homes are this like awful terrible hell on earth the way that many Chicago journalists did in the 80s um but we should be realistic as historians about the actual conditions of that community at that time um which is to say not great and not great for reasons that are varied and complex and historically contingent and yeah that that that's that would be my answer <laughs> your your answer was overthrow capitalism well, yeah no overthrow capitalism uh priority numero uno uh dis like decommodify How? decommodification of housing uh go carol fife something along the lines of Oakland? Uh, make it make it available to more than just a means tested group. Yes, uh, and allow them to have a say in the the development and the running. Of Un- their own universal community. housing with a tenants union. Yeah, or it's just a co op. Yeah. Um, and Richard J. Daly is given the Mussolini treatment up and down mm-hmm. uh, Miracle Mile. Uh, well, we, we got, we were too, we, you mean, oh, yeah, uh, we were too late for Richard Day, J. Daly, unfortunately, uh, however, his son, I, I hold out hope that, uh, he can still get mussolini Uh, I was gonna go with parried in Minecraft. Oh, oh okay. Redacted. Uh, for legal reasons, name. for legal reasons, we must state, we are not advocating for no, the public execution of we're Richard just, M. Daly. We're Daly. just saying, uh, Chicago and the greater Chicago region would have been objectively better had... Richard J. Daly got in parody Minecraft. Hmm. So. 
<laughs> Dude, no one listens to this. Much it's fine. to discuss. Not, <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> not to detract too much from the seriousness of what you were saying, but when you mentioned Richard J. Daly, I had a thought pop in my head, and that was renaming the Chicago Housing Authority to the Honorable Richard J. Daly yes. Memorial Housing Authority. <laughs> <laughs> What oh god it? oh man that's a, that's a slight reference to the blues brothers oh for anyone oh that movie oh, that Aaron, Aaron has never okay seen. so my one of my favorite things in life is called uh. the blues brothers game where Aaron got blackout drunk in college while we watched the blues brothers movie and every so often I'll make a reference to the movie something will come up and then I'll immediately like text Aaron or point to Aaron and be like do you remember that part of the movie and uh, do you remember that car chase scene it's, it's that Aaron a long- it's a long way, uh, it's a long game, it's an ongoing game of figuring out exactly what parts of the movie and, I was blacked out for. The funny part is, there's uh, parts in the middle that Aaron doesn't remember, a little bit after that Aaron does remember, and then Aaron forgets again. Yeah. So it's, 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 it's a wave. The end. The end credit scene happened at the beginning. Oh, yeah! <laughs> That's right. Yeah, when they do Jailhouse Rock at the beginning of the movie. That <laughs> happened at the end of the film. <laughs> That's the thing with the cigarettes and the sunglasses. That's at the beginning. Yeah, I love you, Aaron. <laughs> that's, that's my favorite thing. That was at the beginning. Dude, you, you get blackout drunk and talk uh, about housing more. <laughs> uh, nah. I don't think I would be very good at talking about... There's lots of things I think it would be entertaining to listen to me talk about while blackout drunk. I don't I, think housing is one of them. Probably. Aaron, I would like to have you back as a guest where we can just have fun. What are you talking about? I had no, fun. No, we did have fun. We are having fun. Well, this is still I going. thought my Aren't segment we? would be far shorter than this, oh, I'll no. be honest oh. with you. I was, I mean, I'm ready to talk about it, hell. But Oh, now the segment's over. Put away that paper. Put, put away, away that fucking paper. Put, put the paper over by the D&D green text that we printed out. Yeah. Hey, that's hey, that's high. That's high oh, yeah. prestigious. Oh yeah, I found the. Uh, I found. Are you gonna talk into the microphone? It's like we're on a podcast or something. Turns okay. around. And <laughs> what, do you, what do you want from me? Yeah. So I was. You're not reading off green text found, in the middle of a podcast. And I found that's not uh, what's happening. And I found Swatha's D and D Homebrew Idiot Edition. Yeah, that's how. And I thought I, I had games. lost it forever ago, yeah. but we have it back. Yeah, that's how I made all it my games. It goes with the uh, the holy texts. That's right, it does. Uh, the Old Man Henderson story, Sir Barrington, my thesis, uh, a copy of the Unabomber Manifesto. <laughs> That's that part's not there. The, uh, dude, he's a fucking hack. I'll say he it is right a now. Hack. Unabomber's yeah. a fucking hack. Unabomber? What a shit. Unabomber. Ted Kaczynski, you fuck. Yeah, you, I mean, what a fucking, like, <laughs> I oh, would agree. Uh, technology, women, what the <laughs> fuck? Yeah, I was on board. So what you read it, the first couple paragraphs, is there and you any, go, like, oh, he's, oh, I mean, he's got some points. And then you read the next paragraph, and he goes on a, on a giant yes. incel rant. Yes, the fucking, the plight of capitalism is because of some fucking professor. What the fuck? Unless that professor's name is Milton Friedman, I don't want to bomb. In which case? <laughs> <laughs> no, there are plenty of... Uh, Again, you can't bomb Milton Friedman anymore because he's dead. We're all sad No, you that. can still bomb him. That's true, you still could. Right go ne- to his grave. Right next to Rush Limbaugh. That's true, he was the first... See, now we're not advocating for murder. We're just advocating for property damage. Okay, a list of Which gender will get you. Bathrooms. That's the that's the biggest crime uh, in America. The biggest crime. Margaret Thatcher. That's why. Uh, list of gender no, uh, That's a, the, the cop who killed Breonna Taylor. The only reason why he uh, got convicted. It's because he shot at a building. Yeah, it was because he shot at private property, which I love. A human life? Oh, fuck that. Uh, apartment building. Hey, now. Come on. Your mm-hmm. union can't protect you against that one. Private property. John Locke would like to have a word with John you. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. Look at me. Well, history. Quoting. Uh, I have my copy of Dogmas and Dreams, if we want to dig that out. And, is, that uh, like, is that like a that's the D&D book you read. fanfic? That's the book you read in our professor's class before I took it because I needed the poli-sci credit. I needed the easy credit, so then I took that intro to political theory, and then I also got the dogmas and dreams text. I thought you took the class first. You took the class first. What the hell is dogmas and dreams? I have no idea. It's a it's a source book. It has a bunch of uh, texts from like liberalism and conservatism and no, neoliberalism I didn't take that. and. Uh, I took like intro to government. That's right. With Lovato though. Yeah. Oh, we gotta beat that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's fine. 
No one knows where. It's fine. A, a man named Lovato once said something to us. That's true. And we want to get. And Milton Friedman should die. It's similar levels of who are these people? Who is Milton Friedman? Who is Milton Friedman? I oh, wish, I wish no. I didn't know. I wish no one knew who he was. I wish he was never. Uh, that reminds me of the uh, the Tumblr. No, the Twitter post. And it was, like, a screenshot of what we need is, like, a reboot of the Care Bears, where it's helping millennials through uh, aspects such as depression or uh, other, like, other things that we deal with as a generation. And someone we're Gen- goes... Hey, we're Gen Z. Come on. <laughs> Cuspers. I hate, I hate that. I hate that. So yeah, much. cusping. You don't want to cusp. Generation. <laughs> you want to cusp. cusp. Oh, 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 I was oh. thinking of weighty breasts. <laughs> oh, oh. So the, the two genders, weighty breasts or edging. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but no, uh, to me, generation. My, things, my pronouns is, are please um, and harder. Um, but but someone but someone screenshotted that that Care Bear uh, thing, and they go, I, I can only imagine waking up at three a.m. and shuffling to the refrigerator. I open it up and spin around at the noise behind me, only to have a Care Bear burn out the part of my brain that knows what MK Ultra is. <laughs> I don't need to. Oh, that'll be a subject for a, a later pod, I'm sure, is my theory about how uh, Bobby Rush got MK Ultra. You're not Matt Chrisman. You can't do this. Get out of here. <laughs> you can't step on his territory. You have the beard for it, but you don't. But I create. Sure. As far as I know, I created that conspiracy theory, and I'm very proud of it. Yeah. It is a good conspiracy theory. So, I mean, I had other shit, but honestly, I kind of want to. I like. Um, maybe we should start a new segment called Kurt Talks About Something, because we, we had a pencil and humidifier, and honestly, I'm fucking holding my breath for what's next. <laughs> I, I don't even want to talk about things. I Christ. just want to see Kurt. Okay, <laughs> no, you see, you reacted so badly to the pencil, I did not write no! that. <laughs> Are you kidding me? I love I the love pencil. The pencil. I mean, I hated it in the moment, but I loved it. <laughs> It was horrible, um, but... <laughs> okay, so uh, what I want to do is I want to rant for a little bit. Today oh. we watched a Star Trek episode, <laughs> um, <laughs> and it was a very good episode. I did like the uh, the about, meaning behind have it. Have we talked about Trek in every episode? Yes, yes, yes you have. <laughs> but but the, the plot of the episode is Trek is approached by an old archaeology professor who dabbles Picard in Picard is. Everything. You said Trek. Trek is. Oh. Trek <laughs> is approached. Trek is yeah, approached. Yeah, yeah. At first, I thought, Trebek. I thought you He's said Trek. I was like, I said, yeah, the star of Star Trek, a man named Trek. Trek. <laughs> star <laughs> <of> Trek. <laughs> he was born for and this And then role. my second thought was that you said Shrek. <laughs> Mike um, Myers was the but, star Trek. But Picard is approached by an old uh, archaeology professor who deals in everything. Because, because when you live in... Uh, the universe of Star Trek, you don't specialize in a particular field. You research whatever interests you. I mean, he's you. an archaeologist. That's dystopian. Very dystopian. Researching whatever interests you. Oh, obviously. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but this guy, uh, he's going around, and it's revealed he's, like, finding bits of DNA <laughs> on different planets and realizing that they create a computer program. Finding and, uh, bits of DNA on... So what, a, happens, what did a computer please. come on all of the planets? <laughs> well, well, uh, I, 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 I'll go ahead and spoil, uh, not spoil it. But what happens is Picard runs into Cardassians who are a villain and Klingons who are who are an ally, ally. but are also kind of doing their uh, have their own interests. It's more of a non-aggression pact than it is an actual like uh, an ally situation. And uh, they also have elements of this computer code, and uh, and it's you have to work together and combine your The setup your for pencil bits. was a lot shorter. It was just yeah, one no, word. No, I know, I know, we're getting there. But you have to combine the bits to uh, to to understand this code. And what happens is at the very end, it is revealed that there is a progenitor race, four billion years ago, sent elements of DNA to 
like 20 individual planets. An alien came on 20 planets. Yeah, yeah. And and the bits of the DNA created the humans and created Mm -hmm. the Klingons and created the Vulcans and therefore the Romulans and created the Cardassians. And that's why every race in Star Trek is a person with grievance on their face? It was, yes. And it was a very good episode. Very good episode. But it reminded me how much I have a grievance with progenitor races. In any science fiction thing, it is a trope. In Star Wars, humans are everywhere, but it's not because they were placed there. It's because humans just have a habit of, like, spreading very, very easily. But then someone has to go in and write an old thing where it's, well, actually humans were brought in from somewhere and put at the most advantageous spot in the galaxy for outward expansion, and then they do it in Star Trek, and they do it in Halo, where humans have a predecessor race, and they do it in Battlestar Galactica, where they're searching for the 13th colony of humans, and they do it in every science fiction you thing. have to distinguish between predator race and predator No, system. progenitor. Progenitor, sorry, not predator. Progenitor That's race. A sweet movie, though. Progenitor <laughs> race and progenitor culture. Because. No, but but in all of these, it's a progenitor race. It's not really a culture. In Halo, oh, no. they don't know why humans were on Earth. Uh, for, for all they thought, they had evolved there. Oh, no. Um, okay, something I just. Ursula, I just realized Ursula Le Guin's Hanger Cycle does this, too. Okay, some Okay, so something I just realized. So the episode, like after I watched it, I was like, wonder what like, you know, 90s Christian America thought about it because it's basically, you know, in a sense, I mean, it's not discounting God, but it's mm-hmm. saying God didn't fucking make us. It's some other basically alien race. But now that I think about it, so part of the reason why I was okay with it is because the the the, the forerunners basically to use a halo term, like it was for a good purpose. Like they wanted to like spread life they wanted th- it was an ultimate ho- hope that all these different races would come together in a spirit of cooperation and community to discover things about themselves and their past and it was like you know the klingons were kind of upset the kardashians were upset but the humans yeah kardashians yeah kim was a fucking bitch about it it sucked <laughs> uh but the humans were recognized at best because it's um Like, the humans in Star Trek are basically the best possible versions of ourselves, where it's, um, you know, there's there's no need, there's no strife, yada, yada, yada. And so, in a way, we are represented best by those forerunners, because those forerunners and us have the same intentions about, you know, community and knowledge and things like that. So, in a sense, we are still made in the image of our creator, because we basically turned out exactly like them, and in that way, it's still Christian. Well, I would assume that Christians in the 90s so would they have st- a problem with Star Trek because Gene Roddenberry's a socialist, but... <laughs> yeah. A free, loving... No, but I mean, the thing is, I mean, I mean, I imagine some Christians were upset because it literally said we're not made in God's image. Like, it struck that down. Yeah. But in a sense, we are because if we count... Because we're made if in we the count, image of a perfect... Right, yeah. Of a perfect being, we are basically... After the ideal of... Of, of, of that perfect being. Yeah. So in that way, it's still the God and human relationship, which I just realized. I don't know exactly what that says or means, but, you know, shit's cool. Good episode. Awesome. Uh, continuing on the theme of Star Trek, uh, oh, I believe we may have talked about this before, but Riker is... Definitely uh, bisexual or pansexual. <laughs> I, no evidence in the show, but it no is the canon. No evidence in the show, but it makes sense. Oh yeah. And also in the just likes in the around. episode in which they encounter a a race of individuals who have no gender, except for like about 0.5 to one percent of the population has feelings of a gender identity which and uh and will try to encompass that gender identity you know and like uh in a sort of way transition into that gender role but but the society is repressive and they put them through a (laughs) re-education in which they beat that out of them and force them to conform to the uh the gender role the prescribed gender at birth yes you will i i wonder 
if that's based on anything. I wonder, I wonder, if, that. I wonder if that episode got rave reviews from J.K. But, Rowling. But originally, <laughs> what was supposed to happen was the writers had... Uh, the writers originally wrote it so that the love interest of Riker was going to be, you know, non-binary, but identifies as male. And when they started getting around to actually producing the episode, they were like, Riker? And a man? We can't do that. So they went through, uh, so they went through and they rewrote it so that she, um, you know, was a, a woman and not a man. And, um, you can't be well, space a woman, gay. not binary. And, uh, and apparently, uh, when Jonathan Frakes found out about this change, he was furious. All right, there's the confirmation you need. There's the confirmation you need. <laughs> as, as, our, as long as our big boy Johnny, he wanted to... <laughs> Jonathan Frakes is, uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, knows more about the canon of Star yeah. Trek than Gene Roddenberry. Because <laughs> well, Gene, Ro- to... Gene Roddenberry famously dead. So yeah, Frakes. Queen, you know, and, and, I think, and I think part of it, too, is because there was a kiss in the episode. And Jonathan Frakes was all up for, like, actually acting out that kiss. Jonathan Frakes but, was really excited about it. Actually. He was like, no, I just, I just, I haven't done it before. I'm just, I'm just interested. But yeah. You're kissing a man. Uh, uh, but to do it on screen. I want to do it on screen. Yeah. But kiss he, a man. He explicitly <laughs> Let me kiss a called man. it out as cowardice. Nice. On their part. We, uh, we, uh, the, the, the creators of, uh, the Trek, uh, no homoing, uh, <laughs> Riker. Great. Strong bit there. Uh, um, at some point in the future, too, I want to go on a talk about the moisture farmer's tale, uh, from the Tales from the Maz Eisley Cantina, but I would like you guys to read that. I would like Aaron here for that, but I would like you same, guys to read that. Is this the same book where um, Darth Vader has a love affair with a mouse droid? No. <laughs> is that no. when Master Chief gets sucked off by Cortana? No, I believe that Master is Chief one of the getting newer sucked ones. off by a twink. No, I believe that's <laughs> one of the newer ones. This is from like uh, just a bunch of science fiction authors back when Star Wars was like a new thing before even yeah, the uh, the prequels. God could go back. Uh, they they just wrote articles for the publication because they're like Star Wars is interesting. It it stimulates my senses. So I'm writing a story like about gum. this character oh, who's seen in all of five seconds I, of a new hope. I've seen you play some flash games that are stimulating. I've seen <laughs> Oh, oh. <laughs> uh, rip in peace. R.I.P. R.I.P. Adobe Dude, Flash. Man. There will never be that one story we don't talk about that happened freshman year. <laughs> it's, it's, like, it's, it's like James Willems always says. How do these games get me to give a guy a blowjob? How do these games? <laughs> <laughs> they, uh. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a it was a picture from the land of the rising sun where a cartoon <laughs> Lawrence, woman just say Lawrence just say hentai. God. <laughs> um, another thing we can talk about with you, Aaron, when you come back for Is uh, hentai. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, world building. Oh, you have some interesting theories. Yeah, I, I'm I, sure. I recently uh, I recently discovered that. Uh, the, it's uh, based on the Chinese element system and not the uh, the Greek element system. Oh, you... so there's more than four elements. There's five. That's one more than four. Nice. I uh, hang on. Yeah, okay, that's right. So the D and D multiverse. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad. That, I'm glad the well, uh, applied yeah. math guy was well, here. Well, you know, I have that. to verify. I can't let you history nerds go over that domain. Uh, yeah, so... You'll, f- you'll fuck up a public housing unit doing shit like that. <laughs> so yeah, the D and D multiverse has uh, four elements. Uh, because it's based off the, the Greek ones. Huh? Mm-hmm. Uh, and mm-hmm. creators of Avatar were cowards for making it based off the Greek elements and not the Chinese five elements. What's the other element? Uh, there isn't an additional one. It's actually different. Air isn't an element. Huh. It's wood, water, uh, fire, metal, and earth. The five Pokemon types. Wood. Really? <laughs> We know exactly how much Pokemon I've played. Oh, <laughs> I was deprived as a it's child. A it's bug type. It's a uh, bug type. Another element. Yeah, or like ghost, bug fairy, <laughs> oh, fa- a dragon. Isn't there a normal type? <laughs> yeah, normal. <laughs> no, isn't there a normal type? Yeah, sure. Yeah, there is yeah, a normal. Yeah, type. sure thing, Aaron. There's a fighting type. 
Yeah, yeah, it's a fucking boxer, and he's just in the forest. He's in a forest <laughs> punching wood, and it's a Pokemon. He's a fighting type. I'm picturing like a, a, a dog. Or, or, or one that does like kickboxing, or one that spins on his head and hits you. Something <laughs> ridiculous like that. Yeah. One that reminds you of Noggin Drill. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I am so lost. You have no idea. Okay, okay. Aaron, Aaron, what do you think the Pokemon no, types are? I know no, some of them. No. I played, I played uh, oh, fun, Pokemon fun. Stadium. Fun. Name them. Name them. Pokemon Stadium? That's Brent's favorite game, isn't it? Uh, I don't remember. There's, I played it. There's I water. It. Uh-huh. Water. There's fire or flame. I don't remember which one. <laughs> yeah, fire. We'll give it fire. Um, Flaming. There's plant. Yep, there's, plant. There's, <laughs> there's ground. Okay. There's lightning. Lightning. There's <laughs> ghost. Mm-hmm. There's... They walk through walls. Mm-hmm. The, uh, Bill Murray catches them at various points. <laughs> There's a magic one. Like what's, They did some uh, questionable um, things in the past. Pen and Teller. The what's, Pen and Teller. Right? <laughs> what's, the, what's Abracadabra? The Abracadabra. Uh, what's his type? Spoons. He does spoons. He does spoons. Spoon, spoon type. type. Spoon is, type. Is type. Spoon He's type. big okay. spoon or little spoon? No, he's small spoon. No, it evolves into he's a large two spoon. Spoons. Um, Except Abra has no spoon. <laughs> um, so a spoon type. There's definitely a, like a normal type. I'm wow. almost positive. Wow, you're getting fucking canceled for that one. I there is, yeah, there's what like, it, there's like, normal. Isn't there one that's just like quote unquote normal? Isn't there just one that's just like this with your normal type? That's not a thing. Maybe it's just fighting. Maybe moving I'm on. Fighting. Anyway, fighting is definitely one of them. Fighting. Okay. Um, legendary. Uh, legendary, legendary type. famously, I, t- I think. Um, you know that. that oh, flying, sense. flying, 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 and bug, of course. And bug. You only you got, got a bug. You got yeah. it. That's Pokemon. You got all of them. You got all of them. And normal strong against all of them because normal people are superior and <laughs> shall inherit this earth. Okay, but I'm not wrong for a normal one, am I? Hey, hey. normal is definitely a Pokemon type. I, I'm sorry, but you missed Steel. <laughs> what the fuck? I missed. Mean, Oh, you missed steel. You missed fairy. Uh, Instead of spoon, it's psychic. Psychic. You that missed was dark. What I was of. Dark emo. You know. Mm-hmm. That's um, they go to the hot topic exclusively. <laughs> uh you you missed the uh, the dinosaur Pokemon. Your dragon poison. Is, wait, is dragon? Dra- yes. Is dragon a type? Yeah. Is poison a type? Yep. Wouldn't that be plant? Rock. Oh no, poison is a type. Yes. Uh, rock. There's yep. a lot of there's a there's lot. There's ground and there's rock and there's grass and there's bug. Well, grass and bug makes sense, does it? <laughs> does, I feel like they're all, it's no, all Aaron, a similar ecosystem. If, if I gave you all of Fuck the Pokemon no. types, <laughs> no, and and I enough space away. to work no. with, could you if, make if the you, type? If match Aaron jumps? and a but and Aaron, could you make the? Could, could you make the I, complicated I, rock paper scissors we're guy not for this. all of them? If but Aaron, I am confident we will do this after the podcast. If Aaron if and eleven want. monkeys were at a typewriter, could he invent Pokemon? <laughs> I bet I could get fifty percent of them. I've, I bet yeah, you could too. Could. I'm gonna level with you. Well, Seventy-five. What's fire I mean, weak against? Well, water. That gets uh, you part of the way there. What's yeah. it strong against? Uh, plant. Yeah. And California um, kind of showed how fire. You, you want to know? Well, don't you're gonna give it away? That we're gonna ruin oh, the experience. It's fine. The weakest one is bug. If I remember correctly, it's bug. bug. Yeah, because it involves too early. It's what shit. type is and and the it has the most like negative type matches? I think tangle isn't tangle Tan- and grass. Tangle It's just grass uh, and poison, or just grass. I think it's grass and poison. Maybe only poison. I only know it tangle. would depend on the generation. I only know I tangle because uh, Brian David Gilbert in the video where he talks about his tangle. That's the only reason I know. I always what a thought it was is. pronounced tangela. I don't know. I still don't know how it's pronounced. I took a guess. It looks like uh, Kaplach or whatever the uh, the Klingons eat. Oh God! That's still moving <laughs> in the bowl. There's like purple spaghetti. That there is moving. purple spaghetti yeah. that, <laughs> that moves. Oh my God! T- Pokemon stole from TNG, just like everything else, including <laughs> this podcast. Which one came first, Pokemon or TNG? TNG. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Pokemon's as old as I am. I Original yes. Pokemon's '96, I think. Yeah. A little older. I think wasn't it a card the game first trading though? card game first. I but even then, TNG came out in like '89. <clears throat> Yeah, well, no. Nintendo's the oldest game company because they started producing that's true. Pokemon trading cards in the 1890s. Yes, that's true. That's very true. Uh, God, Nintendo. Yeah, the... <laughs> Miyamoto, you son of a bitch. There's like, uh, 
there's like kanji characters <laughs> and like little pieces of wood. Uh, Tell that to Kanji Club from the, like the 1600s, and that's the original Pokemon. Well, well, I think on that note, on that note, I think that's been another successful in scare quotes episode of two rooms of podcast. Yeah, so we had our friend Aaron. Is there anything you'd like to plug, or if we can put in the description? You should plug your Twitter. I can plug. You can plug. <laughs> I can plug. Okay, I will Glock plug. Twitter. I will plug my blog, where Hey-o. I occasionally write. I took February off, uh, <laughs> like a like a healthy communist. Due, due to due to do what's well, the shortest month, so it's like uh, yeah, it's true. like the best month to take off yeah. if you're if you want. To it's a be nice productive. four weeks. Yeah, yeah. I took February off anyway due to a depressive episode, but. Um, uh, my blog is a research blog about Chicago public housing uh, during the 1990s and 2000s, and it is called The Other Chicago Skyline. You can find it at theotherchicagoskyline.wordpress.com. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, that, I think that about does it. Okay. Well, that link will be in the description below. Follow us at Twitter at Two Roommates Pod. Two Roommates Pod. Two Roommates Pod. I know because I DM'd you earlier. <laughs> Hell yeah! Uh, give us money on Patreon. Yeah, I'm gonna have to start paying to host <clears throat> this. So I'd appreciate it if you would subscribe to the Patreon. Yeah. So now <laughs> this so podcast now, is about to be a net negative. So now, <laughs> so now uh, I want to reiterate: I'm going to do this every episode until it happens. Oh god. Six hundred dollars. I will that send you. Violates money. the terms of service. <laughs> oh shit! Yes, you can't uh, do that. Okay, uh, six hundred and ten dollars because of the hosting fee. Uh. Six hundred and ten dollars uh, uh, for the hosting fee and um, for uh, very exclusive perks. <laughs> uh, uh, not not specified. <laughs> Oh god. We'll, uh we'll make we'll make uh we'll it's the getting sucked off by a twink, so I guess Doug. <laughs> uh, true, true. Twelve hundred Doug will suck sucked you off, off by your friend who is not affiliated with the podcast. In yet. any way whatsoever. Uh and is also a twink. He is what? a twink. He's a twink. This is, this is a real Midwest goodbye for a podcast. <laughs> It always is. This is all. Oh, it if, always is. For every time we say goodbye to Aaron, it's always Midwestern, it's a we're, minimum we're good ten minutes. Uh, well, we got another beer if you want. Mis- Midwestern. Hey, we'll get you on the boat this year. We'll get you. We'll on get the you boat. on the boat. This is that a guest? Oh, I really shouldn't. shouldn't. No, it's different. It's oh, I gotta show place. after. This is how we're gonna end because I need to show you a video. It's a Gus Johnson Excellent. video. All right, and uh, with that, love you all. See you next week. Adios. Six hundred ten. Bye. <laughs>